Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a conversation about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on wildlife conservation in Africa. My name is Katherine Semser. I am a research fellow with the Property and Environment Research Center, PERC. Founded in 1980, PERC is the home of free market environmentalism and is a research institute dedicated to exploring the way in which markets and property rights can encourage conservation. I'm joining you today from just outside of Washington, DC, and I will be your moderator. Wildlife conservation efforts around the world have not escaped the, the disruption wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic. And conservation may be among one of the sectors most deeply impacted by the global shutdown. We now find ourselves in a historic opportunity to reassess and restructure how and why we approach everything from wildlife trade to wildland protection to conservation finance. We will touch on each of these topics today with our panel, but especially the last one. The symbiotic nature between tourism and wildlife conservation, especially in Africa, has historically served both sectors well. Tourism, be it photographic or hunting, has provided the motivation and the means to conserve vast areas of the African continent, recover healthy wildlife populations of rare species, reduce poaching and illegal wildlife trafficking, and increase the ability of African states to engage in rural economic development in a way not dependent on foreign aid or philanthropy. The results of these conservation efforts have kept wildlife tourism a viable economic enterprise, one that had contributed in excess of $100 billion each year to the economies of Sub-Saharan Africa. This according to a report commissioned by the UK Department of International Development. However, the fragility of this system has become increasingly clear in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. The arrival of tourists and their, monies has and their money has precipitously declined as country after country has imposed travel and immigration restrictions. Markets have flirted with bare territory and people's wanderlust and sense of adventure has been tempered by disease risk. The members of our panel are living this reality each day. Dr. Emmanuel Fundira, president of the Zimbabwe Safari Operators Association, Deneen van der Westhuizen, Chair of the Operators and Professional Hunters Association of Africa and President of the Namibian Professional Hunters Association, and Louis Eberschon, Group CEO of African Wildlife Services, can offer unique insight into what the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has been on wildlife tourism and wildlife conservation in Africa. Now, I'd like to start by, by turning to Deneen. Now, Africa's hunting industry has played an essential role in conservation efforts in Africa. It has incentivized the conservation of tens of millions of acres of habitat and the recovery of rare species like the bonta buck and southern white rhino, among other successes. Can you tell us what has been the overall impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the hunting industry at a continental scale? What are your members telling you about their capacity to keep operating and to keep providing inputs to conservation efforts. Hi, Catherine, thank you very much. It's very nice to be part of this webinar. Um, on a global scale or continental scale, the repercussions are massive. For each country, it has various types of different um, scenarios that are being played out. And especially to total different ones, whereas we've got state land, lots of countries that only have tourism and sustainable use practices uh, happening on state or government land. And also many countries across, across Africa operate on private land. Um, and these two have two quite different scenarios uh, that are being played out. Um, communities, for example, in Namibia are extremely reliant on any type of tourism. Um, many countries in Africa uh, only have tourism as the biggest GDP that comes in at this stage. And without tourism, we don't have any habitat protection. And I would say if I have to summarize, or if I were to say our biggest, biggest loss at this stage um, is habitat. Um, communities and people that were previously um, 
had a proper income flow coming from tourism and sustainable use, all of a sudden the, 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 this flow is just cut off and there's nothing coming towards them. So they are desperate to look at different ways. And they are, you know, many countries in Africa are, are very rich when, when you look at the agricultural side of it. But our mission as conservationists and our vision has always been, and, and this was our main focus, is habitat preservation. And if you really want to save habitat, you have to look at ways to have agriculture not play that big a role. In Zambia, for example, many of the communities now look towards uh, charcoal farming, which means masses of areas of deforestation taking place. And you can imagine what the losses would be in wildlife purely because of that habitat that's being destroyed over there. So on a continental scale, you've, our biggest loss at this stage, and, and especially prediction, is, is habitat loss. And it is, um, it, it's, it's the effect coming from no income, people having no income and being desperate to look at, at other ways. I mean, there's many other things that I can mention, like anti-poaching that's going really, um, really wild at this stage. Only in Namibia we've had in the last week various uh, encounters of, of poaching that's happening um, mostly purely for meat. So for sustenance, people are hungry. They don't have any, any income at all at this stage. So poaching is really going on badly. Um, and then obviously, like I said, looking at other ways, you know, starting to try and sell wood, chopping down forests. Um, people are really starting to get desperate all over Africa. And, you know, what are you hearing from your members? You know, you mentioned, you know, an uptick in, in bushmeat poaching um, that was happening in Namibia. Is this something that's happening at a continental scale or does it seem relatively isolated? Uh, what, what are your, the members of, of OFA, the, the Operators and Professional Hunters Association of Africa, reporting back to the organization about what they're seeing on the ground with regards to poaching? Look, it's, it's skyrocketed incredibly. That's the one thing that, are, that has started to happen on an incredible scale. Um, you have to understand that when you, when you conduct hunting, you are, you're, your feet on the ground constantly. You patrol certain areas. You've, you've, you can pay patrol teams and anti-poaching teams that are constantly on the ground. But without hunting being undertaken, there's just, just there's no control happening and there's no people being paid to do these anti-poaching methods. So um, throughout the whole of the UFA membership of all the African countries, this was a very, very big issue coming up. But it's incredible to see all these hunting operators still sticking to it. So they, um, most of the people are taking out loans they are really digging into their last reserves to keep the anti-poaching going because we know that, you know, it's a matter of a few months where masses of wildlife populations can be destroyed through this poaching. Uh, not only by the poaching, but by, by poaching also elevates the movement of the, in, of the animals and it's being pushed into certain areas where they are faced with with um, more poaching and people, you know, uh, encroachment of, of people. So it has a, a effect that just goes from bad to worse. So obviously the poaching is, is really um, very high at this stage, but we've also in Namibia, especially we've seen, or we've heard a lot of people talk of, um, it's actually, it's, it's a very sad story because if you look at the history of Namibia in the 1970s and just before the 1970s, um, on private, uh, privately owned land were sold for much higher prices if you could advertise that no wildlife was on your property. Um, at that stage, most private owned land were occupied with, with livestock, cattle and sheep farming. And obviously wildlife had a massive, was in direct competition with all of this livestock. Um, so in the 1970s, farms were actually sold for much higher prices if you could advertise that there were no wildlife on the property. But since then, through, through the government regulations and changes where, it, where government has given full ownership of wildlife to, to landowners, um, people have valued wildlife much, much more, and they've, um, they've realized that tourism and sustainable use on, on wildlife brings in much, much more money. 
but we're at a situation right now where people are forced to turn it back around again. People are, um, and, and remember we've been, Namibia has gone through a four year, five year, terrible, terrible drought where lots of uh, wildlife was lost in any case, but people are now trying to eradicate certain areas completely with wildlife again, purely so that they can restock it with sheep or cattle so that they have some sort of income by the end of the year. I want to turn to Dr. Fundira for, for a minute, because you know, as neighbors, Zimbabwe and Namibia share some of the same challenges, especially the drought that, that you just mentioned, Deneen. And, and for months, you know, press accounts have detailed the water scarcity issues uh, faced in rural communities in Zimbabwe. And, and I've heard that these have contributed to a decreased social license for conservation in, in some parts uh, of Zimbabwe. And Dr. Fundira, can you give us some insights into how the pandemic has impacted the photo tourism and hunting industries in Zimbabwe? What are the members of the Safari Operators Association telling you? You're on mute, sir. Yes, Catherine. Um, good morning to you and good afternoon to everybody who is in the same time zone as myself. Yes, uh, indeed, um, the pandemic came at a time where uh, Zimbabwe in particular was at its throes in terms of uh, a, a debilitating drought and uh, badly, and also just recovery from the effects of Cyclone I, which hit us in 2019. Um, the, 20, the COVID-19 has added more pain to a very bad situation, uh, punctuated by a widespread cancellation of bookings, which have been recorded uh, every day, daily, by all the operators in the industry across the board. We must also put this thing into perspective. Wildlife uh, in Zimbabwe is the main draw card in terms of attracting tourism. Without wildlife, there's no tourism to talk about. Uh, we, we don't sell buildings. We, we, we present our wildlife as a major attraction for the long haul traveler. And uh, because of um, the closure of borders uh, as from March uh, 2020, it meant that um, uh, we began to see, experience a lot of cancellations. In Zimbabwe, so far to date, we have received 8,000 cancellation of hunting days, which, cons which comprise, which in a, in a true sense, makes up to 90% of the revenue, which is derived from the safari industry. And to put that into perspective again, that is close to 100 million US dollars, which have been lost already in this season. What are, what are the implications? Firstly, on a broader level, tourism contributes 15% of gross domestic product in Zimbabwe, uh, of which uh, the safari business is a very big component uh, in that uh, contribution. In addition to that, more than 800,000 families in Zimbabwe, uh, households, and the household with an average family size of about six, you are talking about 2.4 million people depend on their livelihoods on wildlife utilization. So it effectively means 70% of the population, 17% has been adversely affected in terms of loss of income and earnings because of uh, the, the effects of COVID-19. So now what we're beginning to see is people not suffering from the effects of COVID. Our numbers is all discussing with Louis earlier on, uh, from a COVID perspective are very subdued. Subdued to an extent that you don't even talk of any numbers running into any thousands. In terms of mortality rates, we are still below 10. We are only around four. But our biggest worry and concern at the moment is that people will, will probably even die out of starvation from hunger. Where the, the, the support mechanism, which always existed has been taken away from them. And there are no safety nets which can be put in place in terms of providing a livelihood for those people who are at the branch of this catch. So it is really indeed a crisis. 
Uh, from an operating point of view, uh, just like Namibia is doing, uh, our operators are also showing a lot of resistance, uh, resilience, resilience in terms of putting together resources um, and trying as much as possible to uh, implement anti-poaching measures. Because to a very large extent, where there's hunger, there's also an increase, an ine inevitable increase on poaching, especially poaching for the port, and less in terms of commercial poaching. But we have seen also an increase in that aspect of commercial poaching. Why? Because the defense line, which is always provided for by the safari operators, has somewhat a bit been subdued because of lack of presence in some of those protected areas. And as a result, poaching on its own is on the increase. And that is a major concern. As you are aware, we have experienced a flourishing and a growing population of our species across the board, the big five and everything else. And now what we are beginning to see is a, a depletion, depletion of some of those species from poaching and also from the effects of drought. Wange National Park, which is one of the largest protected areas we have got in Zimbabwe, uh, which really prides in terms of supporting a population uh, number of elephants of more than 20,000 with an ecological capacity, sorry, 40,000, with an ecological capacity of only um, uh, carrying 20, is, sub, is badly, is sub, is, it falls under region five. Region five is um, a drought-stricken area where rainfall patterns are very subdued. And because of that, uh, our elephants in those areas are already suffering quite a lot of stress. And the resources to support those elephants in terms of providing water are also um, grossly affected. And these are issues which are really a cause for concern. And we are seeing this year as a bloodbath, to say the least, in terms of the effect of COVID-19 and what is happening both to the livelihoods of humans and also in terms of the sustenance and protection of our wildlife resources. You know, you discussed the hunting operators and, and you know, their continued engagement in anti-poaching despite the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what about the photo tourism side of the industry? How is the photo tourism side of the industry faring um, in relation to the pandemic? And, and what are you hearing from those operators? Well, it's equally as bad. It's equally as bad as long as we've got borders which are closed. Um, Unlike other neighboring countries where there's some semblance of, a, of domestic tourism, in Zimbabwe, domestic tourism is very subdued because of the economic uh, situation we find ourselves in. There's very little disposable income and there's no domestic tourism really to talk about at this stage. And what is happening, the only thing which has happened with our colleagues in the, photo, uh, in the photographic industry is that, um, people have become more innovative. We have now created, seen the creation of an interactive process where we now have um, a platform where some operators are beginning to sell uh, some of their products on a virtual platform like the one we are use, using today, where people are, begin, are enjoying uh, the watching wildlife, interacting and um, dialoguing with the professionals who can answer certain questions to them regarding how the behavior of, of those animals is it, it's, it's not really bringing any revenue, but just keeping people afloat in terms of creating an awareness that we still have a flourishing wildlife and that business exists. But to a very large extent, our colleagues in the photographic industry have been badly affected as long as the borders are open. But um, we are hoping and we keep keeping our fingers crossed that these borders may start opening by the beginning of September thereabouts, or maybe mid-August, which means there could be a likelihood of salvaging only a portion of the year, uh, which is, would be left by only a, a period of about three to four months. Now, you mentioned Huangi National Park just a few minutes ago. Um, yes. I know the Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority um, had a budgetary shortfall at the end of last year. 
and that much of their operating revenue comes from, um, you know, from, from tourism related fees, um, you know, be they the entrance fees for, for parks, hunting related fees, et cetera. Um, what are you hearing from, from the parks authority in terms of uh, their ability to conduct operations? You know, Deneen was saying that hunting operators are unable to pay their anti-poaching patrols. Um, is Zim Park similarly having difficulty paying their staff as a result of, of the, the tourism shutdown? Yes, the last information received from the Director General of Fulton Mangwan uh, was that uh, they're now so low on resources that come um, July, they will not be able to pay their staff, full stop. And we are looking at various ways and means of seeing how we can leverage. Unfortunately, as you are aware, uh, Catherine, the um, wildlife uh, resource in, in Africa, especially in Zimbabwe, uh, protects itself. What I'm saying is the resource which come from wildlife out of tourism, is the same resource which is put back into conservation. And when that resource is not available, it means you now have a, a, a conservation program which is vulnerable. And uh, we really fear facing a fairly dire situation in terms of what will happen in the next few months or even what will happen post COVID-19 where the recovery process is not going to be easy. We are not fortunate enough to have them um, a fairly strong fiscal uh, support from our government uh, in as much as, tries as much as possible to provide some government guarantees for people to secure loans from banks. But again, banks can only go as far as they can. With the money they hold, they hold on behalf of their clients and they cannot be reckless in terms of allowing that money to go somewhere where there's no likelihood of ever getting a return from it. So the situation remains very, very dire. I don't see them being able to continuously pay the rangers. Now, if that happens, there'll be a disaster on our hands in terms of that semblance of protection which is already existing at the moment will disappear. Now, I wanted to turn to Louis because you know, both Dr. Fundira and Deneen had, had poaching as a common theme um, in their descriptions of what's happening in, in their respective countries and also at a continental scale. And, and Louis, you know, poaching, anti-poaching is, is what you do as a business. Um, you live it every day. And, you know, we've heard about the uptick in, in bushmeat poaching. There's also been conflicting press reports about increases in rhino poaching versus decreases in rhino poaching um, as a result of the pandemic. As someone who works, you know, with anti-poaching units in the field, um, what are you seeing um, on the ground in, in, in terms of, of poaching? And, and uh, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the feral dogs that you were mentioning before we went live today. Good morning to you. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, good afternoon to our colleagues in the same time zone. Um, thanks for the opportunity. And yes, definitely, <clears throat> there are some interesting um, trends that is occurring. And I have to echo, obviously, what my uh, colleagues have said, both Deneen and uh, Dr. Fondira, because uh, of this impoverished situation, people are definitely becoming desperate and they are also getting innovative. And yes, uh, desperation leads to the manifestation of uh, the formation of feral dog packs, for instance. So because there's no money to buy dog food in an impoverished community, you'll find that the dogs will start forming feral packs and they'll go off hunting on their own without their masters. So they're not only the poachers' dogs uh, escorting or um, going with their masters to go and poach, they go and hunt for themselves. So it's not only humans that are increasing the subsistence level of poaching but the dogs or the animals themselves because they also need to survive when it comes to the commercial poaching side of things uh, again criminals are very innovative and when you close down an industry or a trade uh, basically what you do is you effectively stimulate or create a black market so you just incentivized uh, the black market and the smugglers 
for people that deal in, let's say, uh, cocaine, human trafficking, rhino horn, ivory, you know, the illegal wildlife trade. That has now just gone deeper underground. Because <clears throat> when you restrict trade, take for instance the example of cigarettes. People are not going to stop smoking because there is no trade legally allowed. To the contrary, they just find innovative ways of smuggling and getting this product because the world works on a demand and supply basis. So even though we've got global lockdown due to this pandemic, the trade in wildlife products, whether it's illegal, illegal or legal wildlife products, has not been stopped. Yes, there is a, a reduction in, in air travel, but what about shipping or cargo planes? So the, the black market has just gone a level deeper. So it has become much more difficult for us to police or to control the illicit wildlife trade. You know, it, it, we need to look at land use and what we're going to do when it comes to this crisis and these threats that we are dealing with. The fact that there is no income, that is an increased threat. The fact that there is no safaris, whether it be consumptive or non-consumptive, that means there is no money for counter poaching unit, uh, units to sustain or keep their employees. I've seen where rangers have deserted because they are working overtime in inhumane hours. You know, so yes, uh, I have to uh, concur with what Deneen and Dr. Fondira said earlier. There are still private uh, entities and rangers that are so deeply committed and passionate about biodiversity that they, they're putting every single cent that they own of their own resources into trying to protect biodiversity. But when it comes to employees and bigger organizations, people have families that are starving, you know, so they are also deserting and they are also, you know, trying to, to improvise or just stay alive. Because again, uh, COVID is not the only threat. The, the way that we use land, uh, the, the increase in illegal uh, um, wood harvesting, charcoal farming, is phenomenal. It's also winter, it exacerbates the problem much more. You know, so when it comes to uh, the, the, the counter poaching or the illicit wildlife trade or the illegal utilization of our renewable resources, it has definitely increased in, uh, in or during this uh, pandemic. It has definitely not decreased, as many people would like to argue. <clears throat> now, you know, without getting... Also, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. You know, we, we need to look at what are we going to do about human encroachment? You, you have to balance the, uh, the scales here and take emotion out of the conversation here because people are desperate and dying. Uh, what are we going to do when it comes to the utilization of the available land? The, the globe is overpopulated with humans. We're all mammals as well, but the, the human encroachment on the available resources is pushing our wildlife out of existence. Uh, Deneen said earlier, and I agree, people are looking at alternative forms of utilization of the land in order to survive. That leaves no space for our wildlife. So we need to be fair and we need to be very creative here and we need to be unemotional when we look at how we're going to utilize our land and the available land in order to ensure the survival of, of uh, certain flagship species and biodiversity. So, you know, it, it's really tough out there. It is still a, a war basically when it comes to illegal wildlife trafficking because the criminal syndicates that deal in uh, human trafficking or narcotics as well as uh, Wildlife uh, like ivory and rhino are the same syndicates. It's criminally 
uh, it's, it's criminal syndicates that we need to address here. And without any resources coming in from the tourism industry, we, we can't continue this battle. We're at a loss. So we need tourism, which typically has paid and funded uh, the, um, um, what is the word? Sorry, I'm at the loss now, the, the uh, environmental law enforcement. So yes, we are desperate. We need to get global trade going and we need tourism, uh, consumptive as well as non-consumptive tourism use so that we can continue to protect these beautiful biodiverse areas that we have left, these pockets that we have left. And we have to put them to the best possible use to ensure its survival and not only its survival, but also our own survival, because we as humans are dependent on biodiversity, not only on one species, but on the diversity, the trees, the animals living together in harmony. And we need to start living in harmony with our environment as well. Yeah, you're in South Africa and um, you know, Deneen you know, is in Namibia. Um, both of your countries you know, are, are trying to, to use domestic tourism uh, as a bridge to, to, to reviving the international tourism market. Um, how is that going in South Africa? I know that they've recently reopened the private game farms to biltong hunting. I know the Game Ranching Association is trying to convince government to allow for, for day trips to game ranches for photo tourism. Is this something that government seems receptive to um, as a bridge to reviving the international tourism market? Um, or is there political resistance um, because of the disease risk? Uh, thank you for that question. I think there is a, a, a huge compliment that needs to be paid here to some of our industry leaders and organizations because they've been lobbying our government and they've come up with very amicable uh, suggestions and solutions. So I think there is a newfound uh, sense of cooperation and collaboration to try and open up the domestic market in South Africa. Um, it will be a kind of stimulus for the economy, but we still have uh, certain uh, aspects that need to be clarified. For instance, when it comes to the biltong hunting or, or the venison harvesting, there is a debate at the moment to distinguish between recreational hunting and subsistence hunting. Now, there, we need clarity from government to distinguish whether uh, recreational hunting is going to be seen also as a form of subsistence hunting or not. Because typically, your traditional Bolton hunter will eat uh, the meat that they harvest from the animals that they collect. But that is now being defined as recreational hunting. So we need clarification from our government that so simulate that in, on interprovincial travel, which is like, for instance, traveling from one county to another county. So people are still not allowed to travel interprovincially in South Africa. And then they're also not allowed to sleep over, uh, except, you, you know, from a tourism uh, perspective. But the hunters obviously are allowed to sleep over and there's limitations on group sizes. So there's good developments and a, a good amicable uh, collaboration between government and uh, the industry to uh, facilitate and to try and open up this market. And, you know, we keep working on it, and we hopefully will have some breakthroughs in that regard. And just to bring this back to the anti-poaching issue, um, if this market is opened, you know, will that bring in sufficient revenues to, to bring anti-poaching efforts back to the level they were pre-pandemic? Un unfortunately, I seriously doubt that. You know, we, we need the trophy hunting revenue, which which generates foreign uh, capital uh, for, for our gross domestic product and which generates profits. Uh, the profit margins in ecotourism are typically very small. And, you know, without foreign currency, 
supplementing this income and without uh, donations, there is just no way that we will be able to continue to fund counter poaching operations or anti poaching operations. It's it is it's not an industry where you make money in. It is something that you do because you are passionate and you care for. So it's it's a matter of giving. And for that, we need global support, not, not only local support. And buy-in, buy-in from the communities, as well as uh, local government, national government, regional cooperation and international cooperation. We need free trade, uh, regulated and ethical trade. And we need to involve the people on the ground, the communities, because it's about land use and how people are going to structure the available land use in future, post-pandemic, in my opinion. I'm going to ask each of our panelists the same question to, to summarize things, and then we'll open it up to audience Q&A. If you are sitting in the audience right now and have a question for our panelists, please use the Q&A feature um, and submit your question. And uh, we'll get to those in, in just a few minutes. But I wanted to, to start wrapping things up by, by asking each of you, uh, what do you see coming in the, the next 12 to 18 months vis-a-vis -vis, you know, wildlife-based tourism in Africa and, and resulting wildlife conservation efforts? And, and to just you know, put some sideboards on that, because that's a pretty wide ranging question. What do you think needs to happen in order for tourism and conservation to revive their partnership to the scale it had been prior to the pandemic? And are there changes to the system that you would like to see made? Um, are there things that you would like to see national governments either take on in terms of changes or the international community uh, in terms of how it approaches conservation in Africa? And I, I guess we'll start with, with Deneen, um, go, go back, you know, full circle. Um, what do you think about those, those, those issues? Hi, oh, Catherine. Okay, I have to remember all your various questions that you've just <laughs> asked. But um, yes, I think, I think, you know, on one hand, I'm very glad for a situation like this to have happened because I think it really brings us all back to a point as to ask some serious questions on, on what are we doing? How are we utilizing? Are we responsible about our wildlife, about our habitat? And one thing that comes to mind with me immediately is that we, we don't have any resilience. You know, look at, look at what happened just now. Flights, uh, planes stopped flying and all of a sudden wildlife is, is plummeting. And um, it, it shows you that we need to start think of, of different ways to, in, to to make sure that habitat ultimately survive, that to make sure that, that wildlife soars. Um, we have to fight stronger fights in the world out there uh, for our sovereign rights. We have to fight much harder um, to be able to trade in, in some, of this, some of our animals on a responsible and ethical way. I think various things need to happen. And I think, you know, first and foremost, I think governments have made some serious decisions that yes they want to protect people and and livelihood of people but i think to a detriment scale that that they they never envisioned and i think it um it's gone so far you know we have to ask ourselves to the cost of what and at this stage if, if things are going to continue as it is if if we're not allowed to travel if we're not allowed to to responsibly take in tourists that can pay these revenues, that can help um, fund anti-poaching efforts, that can help fund the protection of habitat ultimately, then I see a total turnaround of, of, of what we have at this moment. You know, Louis was perfectly correct when he stated that we've got mm. a massive human um, encroachment pop population problem. And, not, and, and uh, you know, I don't wanna s tell people to, um, <laughs> stop having fun and not <laughs> becoming more in the world, but we need to be responsible about it. We need to look at how conservancies are structured, how communities are structured. Um, we need to stop just giving things away. Um, we need to make sure that, um, that it's not only incentives, monetary incentives, incentivizing communities to protect wildlife. Um, and I think we need to start look at wildlife pathways and protect, protected areas where um, 
money is not necessarily driven into communities all over the areas, but into specific municipal hubs where proper schooling can be done. I think you know, lots of things go through my mind, but I think this is a big lesson for us all. I think it's, we realize that we need to think of different responsible ways and not only rely on tourism and on outside countries. Um, you know, we sit with all the assets, we sit with the wildlife and the nature, but still we are dependent on the international market to sustain this. And we need to put our heads together to see how we can go about not be so reliant on the international markets. And at the same time, show our responsibility to, towards our wildlife and our habitat, which has happened throughout the years, you know, it's, but, but ultimately we need to figure out how to save this habitat without people going in, into absolute poverty, um, hunger, but mainly destroying habitat ultimately. And Dr. Fungira, how would you respond to, to the same question? You know, what do you see coming in the next 12 to 18 months? And, and, you know, what do you think needs to happen, you know, in terms of, of changes to the system um, so that we don't find ourselves in the situation um, that we're currently in ever again? Yes, uh, thank you, Catherine, for, for, for that question. Um, obviously, this is a new normal which we never bargained for and we never hoped for and we're never prepared for it. Uh, but one thing which has really come to the fore, which I think the whole world and the globe can really understand, is that there's a strong nexus between uh, our natural resources, which is a, an endowment we have uh, in Africa in, in general, and the connection uh, with um, the maintenance and sustenance of our human lives. That nexus and interdependence is more pronounced now where we are beginning to see communities who really thrived when tourism was uh, at its best, at its peak, are now being subjected to starvation, hunger, and, um, uh, and all sorts of ills. We have also seen a collapse in terms of infrastructure uh, in those rural areas which were generally maintained by the resources coming out of, out of wildlife. The point then comes that is these issues are addressed not only by our own governments, but from a global point of view. When you talk about CITES as a trade body, for example, they should also seriously consider in terms of focusing more on trade issues to see how we can trade this, these natural resources. Just to emphasize the point Anina has already mentioned, uh, we should be able to trade and get value from our resource for the betterment and protection of our natural habitat. If we are not able to do so, it means we are actually end up being deprived and end, ending up with a depleted resource, which ends up with a human loss, starvation, and poverty, which is very much in contrary in terms of um, the, human, the United Nations development goals, where there's a greater emphasis in terms of driving the agenda of taking people out of poverty. This is a natural resource, which I think to a large extent as we research post-COVID-19, certain rules and regulations on trade of our resources should be relaxed so that they, these same resources can go towards the protection of the, our biodiversity, our environment, our flora and fauna, and also giving some sustenance and economic, social economic support uh, for, the, for the human lives, especially people who live uh, with, with, with those uh, with adjacent to the protected areas. Of late, in my country here in Zimbabwe, there's been a huge, huge spike of human and wildlife conflict. And this is being caused by the issues which Louis also brought about, where as people starve, they, they continue wanting to move to find some form of sustenance. And when they do, they place no regard whatsoever to animals. They place more regard to human lives. But as we know, we, re we believe very, very strongly on sustainable use. We want to see a coexistence uh, where the economy can thrive 
by ensuring that that particular resource is well protected, maintained, and continues to thrive so that it can sustain both social economic development as we move forward. So the new normal, the new normal, both our governments and the global village should fully understand that the wildlife can only be able to be to remain sustainable if it can be it can look after itself if opportunities are created and we've got a conducive environment where we can trade on our resource through legal means through legal means by so doing that in itself will ensure we can have a sustainable and economically viable environment thank you thank you and Louis, I would ask you the same question. You know, what do you see coming in the next 12 to 18 months? And, and what changes do you think are necessary in the system at either a national or a multilateral scale um, to, to avoid these types of situations from ever happening again? Thank you, Catherine. Um, I, I like the, if I can borrow Emmanuel's uh, new normal uh, word there, because it feeds into what I believe uh, is uh, a creative and an innovative new business model that is required. Uh, because it should be based, uh, in my opinion, on obviously real and tangible benefits to the communities, which I, uh, I wish we had a, a community representative here participating. But that, I think, would be key, is community participation and benefits that we require in a new, new normal, as, as Dr. Fundira called it, in a new creative, innovative business model. But we also need to then, after the community uh, benefits, consider the wise use of the soil. In other words, how can we commercialize or capitalize on the use of the soil? And then thirdly, how do we utilize or the wise use of the flora, the, the plants, whether it be trees or timber or any kind of plant, herb, forb, shrub that grows on the land because medicines are manufactured to counter attacks like these uh, zoonotic uh, diseases or pa uh, pathogens that, that we are dealing with at the moment. Med medicines come from herbal remedies traditionally. So we need to look at creative, innovative uses or wise uses, sustainable uses for the flora that is on the land. We need to also then consider the fourth point, which is the wise utilization of the megafauna that lives on the land. So let's not confuse the issues with emotion here. Let's look at the, the basic requirements of land utilization. What are we doing with it? Uh, I know people have discussed, you know, investing in the green economy and maybe developing uh, biological or uh, uh, business uh, models that is based on uh, uh, conservation rather than industrialization, which has a huge carbon footprint. I mean, we could, I mean, the carbon offset industry is a well acknowledged industry. Uh, uh, going back to the Kyoto Protocol and carbon offsets and carbon trading. There are business models in existence and there are opportunities for developing new business models along with community participation so that the communities, the people living with the wild animals on the land can benefit directly. Now, traditionally, we used to have the, 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 the tourism industry, consumptive and non-consumptive, that used to try and develop this, but we've kind of reached a sort of an impasse, if I can say that, and then this global pandemic that resulted in this lockdown. So Deneen is quite right there, and, and maybe she can step in here and help me. How do we create, as you say, Deneen, something else that we can generate, a plan B, so that we're not fully dependent on only one solution? I mean, the, the the international tourism or the tourism model is only one solution. How do we make it more sustainable? How do we diversify, for instance? If, if that kind of answers your question, Catherine. It does. Deneen, did you want to, to jump in on that?
Uh, let me see. Am I, okay, I just had to unmute myself. I just wanted to, um, again, just reiterate what, what Louis said as well. You know, one of the solutions that many governments and many countries have come up with um, by now is regional uh, um, tourists and um, in-country tourism to start to take place, especially, you know, in Namibia, most of our borders or, or state borders are open, so you can go camping and, and try and support your tourism market at this stage. But um, ultimately, to be able to sustain what we've had and to be, to be able to continue with a enlargement of habitat and wildlife, or at least uh, um, keeping the numbers that we have, we, we have to realize that tourism, um, like I said, leaves behind a massive footprint. If you can just, um, if, if, and there, you know, a perfect example comes in when you correlate hunting versus a normal tourism lodge. Uh, one hunter pays the same amount of income uh, or money for an experience in a week that it would take sometimes 50, 60 tourists to do. So just, just think of the amount of toilet paper um, of those two scenarios that's being, that comes into the habitat quotation. So we have to um, not only, again, to just reiterate it, look at the tourism sector of it, even though we are all conservationists and in the tourism industry at this stage, we need to build resilience and the answer won't come um, just from me or from anybody else on this panel. Each country is very, very unique and um, we need to do a brainstorm and we need to sit together to figure out how can we help each other, especially in Africa. We as Africans need to stand together and say, this country is unique in, in sunlight and this country is unique in this. And we need to stand together to exactly like Louis said, um, build incentives that's not destructive and build incentives that is not necessarily um, monetized. There needs to be a proudness and a heritage in this as well. And I think we need to put our heads together and I think we need the support of our international friends and sponsors and donors to help us build this resilience in the future. There is, there is an answer. So I just, you know, we need to, I think nature has become too easy. It's become way too easy for, to use and abuse. It needs to be handled as a, as a diamond in, you know, and, and we need to go far and beyond to protect that through various other means. And maybe, maybe this is the platform for, for people that are against sustainable use, for example, to come together with us and see, but ultimately we all just want to, want to end up um, as conservationists, um, but also to still be human and to be part of that whole circle of life um, and to be the custodians of that. So long and short, sorry for the long answer, but there is no one way. I think each country, every country is unique and we need to put our heads together to see how we can build this. Um, but trade is very important to quickly interrupt. I don't want to interrupt you, but I've seen one question um, somebody asked on what is our feel on the, on the international trade ban and how that will affect it. And, you know, we have to remember that to stop trade, um, this whole pandemic was started because of illegal trade. Uh, people are so confused between the two, legal and illegal. To just go about and stop legal trade, this will cut Africa's throat even more. So we should stop su supporting or just having voices about trade, wildlife trade. It started to become a negative, um, be only seen as a negative context, and it shouldn't be. We need trade. Um, of any sort, you know, for example, just the meat. I mean, if uh, the absolute healthy meat of wildlife that can be exported, but the restrictions are crazy. Uh, it just cuts our throats more and more and more. So there's a big difference between illegal trade, which places us in this conundrum versus legal trade. Well, thank you all for those thoughts. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I wanted to get to some of the, the audience questions. Um, to just take a look here in my queue, forgive me. Um, 
So someone is asking the diversification of income generation related to projects in community wildlife conservation has been talked about for a long time as a way to complement hunting income. What efforts are being made to make this real and enhance resilience, especially by safari operators? And Dr. Fungira, maybe I'll, I'll give that question to you. Um, what is happening in Zimbabwe to, to, to make you know, communities more resilient in the absence of, of hunting in, income? Is there anything currently being deployed on the ground? Yes, th thank you, Catherine. Yes, indeed. Um, in fact, uh, the, the, the programs we have got, especially through the Campfire Project, which is the Community Areas Management Program for Indigenous Resources, is where uh, we capacity build communities. Instead of just giving them uh, money in terms of cash, what, is actually, what actually happens there is that um, the resources coming out of wildlife are being deployed towards infrastructural development like building of clinics, uh, dams for irrigation, so that the communities are able to grow vegetables and same vegetables to be used by the same uh, operators and lodges in those particular areas where the people can have a sustainable way of looking after, after themselves. So the whole uh, arrangement is not a dependence one, but it becomes interdependent and also with a, an element of growth in it, in providing people with the tools to use so that they can be able to be self-sustaining uh, for, for a longer period and not necessarily wait for a check as it is drawn at the end of the hunting period. So the, the programs are already there and they are in place and we are beginning to see communities thriving. Bores are being drilled, clinics, like I said, hospitals are being built, including schooling. And all these are infrastructural issues which are sustainable over generations. And those are um, the effects of um, managing and giving back to the community in a sustainable way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this question, I think, you know, would be good for either you know, Deneen or, or Louis, but biodiversification has been mentioned in the talk. Should the safari hunting industry create a new business model where these companies, along with governments and local communities, create long-term commitments so real, wise development can occur. Um, to, to put a fine point on that, uh, are safari hunting companies positioned to become biodiversity conservation companies? Um, yes, it's my good friend Tom Oakley that has posed that question. And I, I honestly believe that safari companies are already um, biodiversity conservation companies. They are just not, their narrative is just wrong. They are just not outspoken about exactly what they do to really have all of this biodiversity. But yes, can we better? Most certainly. Um, can we have better government um, interaction with hunting, safari hunting companies? Yes, most certainly. Um, and hopefully this will force governments to work closer with privately owned companies to, to really get to a much wider biodiversity uh, conservation effort. Louis, maybe you just want to add on to that. Uh, hi, thank you. I, I agree. Um, yes, I think the majority of safari companies are poised to develop and to diversify. Um, I might like, I would like to add maybe uh, a scientific component here, because uh, obviously if we bring in the science when it comes to sustainable and wise utilization, we need science. So I think safari companies need to develop a holistic approach there are certain models in existence already, and the majority of safari operators are uh, quite diverse and do not only focus on one product or one particular service, to their credit. So uh, yes, new business models, or let's rather say the, the further uh, development of business models, I think is required to, to ensure the wise utilization, but not only uh, utilization, but sustainable utilization. 
so that we can address the fears of global community when we're talking about it's 17 hours zoonotic diseases uh, so if we have the science to back us up when it comes to the sustainable utilization of our resources that way i think we will gain global support for what we're doing because at the moment it appears that there is an impasse between the pro and, and, and the non-utilization or consumptive lobbies. And we need to build a bridge there because we all want the same uh, objective, which is a biodiverse planet that we can live in and that we can be ourselves in and be acknowledged for who and what we are. It's, this is a beautiful world. It's, if I could say it, I mean, it's, it's God's property and we are just the, the custodians that's supposed to take care of it. So we need to, to develop that kind of model where we are uh, in, uh, including everyone, not exclusive, but inclusive. Well, we're coming up at the end of the hour. I want to thank each of our panelists for participating in this conversation today. I think it's been a fascinating and an enlightening discussion. I, I can see that our audience has a lot of questions that we just don't have time for. Where can audience members reach each of you uh, with follow-up questions for, for more information? Dr. Fundira, is, is there a place audience members can reach you to, to ask any additional questions they might have? Um, yes, um, I, I guess um, I can share my email um, if, if that is um, a, a preferred avenue or, or a Zoom um, platform or discussion if they want a face-to-face -face discussion. My email is uh, ifundira at makuti dot c o dot z w if fundira at makuti dot c o dot z w i hope it's clear it is thank you and janine is there a place people can go for additional information if they have questions for you yes sir. Very welcome to contact me at uh, CEO at UFA.org. That's CEO at OPHAA.org. And Louis, where can people reach you with additional questions? They're welcome to send me an email. It's uh, Louis, L O U I S, at African Wildlife Services.co.za. All lowercase. Just one word, Louis, L O U I S, at African Wildlife Services .co .za. Well, thank you everyone for, for sharing your experiences and your insights with us today. I'm Catherine Semser with the Property and Environment Research Center. You can reach us at www.perk.org. And thank you everyone for tuning in today. We will get through this crisis together and we will ensure a future that is bright and healthy for Africa's people and wildlife. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Thank, Thank you, you, Catherine, everyone. for setting this up. Thank you, Catherine. Really appreciate it. Have a great Thank day, you. everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you.